there's uh, uh, a lot that changed in ACI 318.11 from the uh, previous edition of uh, Appendix D in 318.08. Uh, so it got a lot, of a lot to cover today. Um, the one uh, uh, advantage of this is that uh, I can tell you that the provisions for Anchorage in 318.14 will be essentially uh, identical to those in 318.11. Uh, they will be uh, in a different format, um, and they'll be part of the body of the code in, as a chapter, but uh, otherwise unchanged. So if you can learn... Uh, if you can learn 318.11, then you're good for uh, a whole other cycle, which is unusual in this business. All right, with that, uh, let's proceed. Um, I'm going to talk today about three basic uh, things that were adjusted in 318.11. Uh, the first um, uh, were some pretty substantial modifications to the seismic provisions uh, for anchor design. Uh, the second uh, is the inclusion of uh, adhesive anchors into uh, 318, uh, which was a major effort, and uh, uh, we'll talk uh, a lot about that. And finally, uh, some miscellaneous changes that were made uh, at the back end of the cycle, uh, particularly to the shear provisions. Uh, a little background uh, to how this happened. Um, there were uh, uh, a lot of uh, issues raised um, uh, in the past about the seismic provisions in uh, Appendix D and um, how they were being uh, applied in the field uh, or not applied, uh, depending on how uh, reasonable it was to use them for specific issues. Uh, and so uh, there was a, an early look made at uh, the way those provisions were put together and what could be done to, uh, to make them better. And at the same time, uh, we were clearly responding uh, to a desire to have adhesive anchors in the building code, uh, particularly as a result of the uh, failure of uh, some anchors in, uh, in Boston in 2006. So uh, those two things uh, came together and resulted in a fairly extensive change uh, in the Appendix D provisions. Uh, on the seismic side, the things that were identified uh, originally were to, to, to try to address the, uh, uh, the 0 0.75 factor that is used in the uh, check for anchor ductility uh, because it seemed to be making that uh, ductility check particularly onerous uh, in the 2008 code. And those of you who have uh, listened to uh, Dr. Ghosh give presentations on this subject in the past uh, may remember that he, he talked about that at some length. Um, there were other issues coming up uh, with the ability of, um, of the Appendix D provisions to be applied to standard problems like uh, wood sill plate design uh, that didn't seem to work well uh, uh, given the restrictions on uh, uh, ductile anchor design. And uh, so that also uh, received quite a bit of attention and some uh, additional research was conducted by the Structural Engineers Association in Northern California. Uh, and all of that taken together meant uh, that we needed to take a hard look at the way those provisions were put together. Uh, finally, there were some things that came up uh, along the way in terms of how the seismic uh, provisions were uh, being applied to uh, anchor design problems. and so. Uh, a number of uh, uh, changes were made to try to make those provisions uh, more useful. Uh, the original proposal in ACI went through uh, uh, the Seismic Committee, uh, uh, committee Subcommittee H, and it was uh, CH025 was the proposal. And it went through a lot of changes along the way uh, and also during the public comment phase. Uh, but the things that were eventually addressed were the uh, terms for the ductility check on anchors, the requirements for stretch length of ductile anchors, and we'll talk about that, the requirements for the ratio of ultimate to yield strength of ductile anchors, and uh, inclusion of reinforcing bar uh, as a uh, ductile anchor material, uh, and finally, clarification on how to conduct the ductility check where you have uh, anchor groups subjected to non-uniform tension. 
Uh, it sounds like an arcane case, but it's actually fairly common. And uh, uh, the way that the provisions were structured in 2008 gave you no clue as to how to handle that. 